Hello everyone. A few days ago, a panel discussion was held for the National Conversation on Rights and Justice in Washington, D.C., and it focused on feminism and female empowerment. Moderated by Soledad O'Brien, the panelists included Dr. Avis Jones de Weaver, founder of the Exceptional Leadership Institute for Women, and who you may recognize as the subject of a previous video of mine. A link is in the description. Dana Adell, PhD and Executive Director of the Spark Movement, a, quote, girl-fueled organization working to ignite an anti-racist gender justice movement. Marianne Schnall, Founder and Executive Director of Feminist.com. And Rachel Simmons, author of Odd Girl Out, The Hidden Culture of Aggression in Girls. The discussion centered around feminism and female empowerment. Now, at the time of this recording, a video covering the entire panel discussion has not been posted. Instead, the National Archives have provided a selection of segments from the talk, and it is one of these segments I will be focusing on, as I found it very telling. Now, just a warning that the clip begins abruptly. My editing skills are not that bad. So, with all of that as preamble, let's begin. The, the change, the empowerment message that we as a greater community should be working toward. If you had to tick off, like, hey, these are the two top things that we need, be to, we need to be focused on in terms of empowerment or in terms of making change, what are they? Just so we're clear, the question posed to these professional, experienced activists and intellectuals regarding female empowerment is, what are the top two things that need to be focused on in terms of women's empowerment and making change. The top two. A very straightforward and, you would assume, easy question for these women. Oh my gosh, where's your list, ladies? Jeez. <laughs> Cue crickets noise. <laughs> When you say making change for girls? Yeah, I think in general. I mean, I know, for example, if you're talking about minority women, I would guess economic empowerment um, because, clear, first of all, this is your area, so doctor, jump on in whenever you want. <laughs> uh, but but I, I think that for a lot of minority women who want to start businesses, there's no funding, right? Right. For minority women, there's no funding? Maybe this was discussed during a part of the panel I don't have access to, but I would really like to know what she meant by that. Because if people are being denied business loans on the basis of race and or gender, that's a federal crime. So there's got to be some, you can't have economic empowerment if you don't have all the policies supporting those things that could actually help women of color in their communities. So look, I'm coming up with a list and I'm the moderator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it is a bit ridiculous that nothing has occurred to any of the panelists as their top two priorities for women's empowerment, isn't it? Um, so, uh, since I teed you up for economic empowerment, what's your number two? About? Well, that's absolutely, that's absolutely true, you're right, because if you look at the wealth gap, you look at this issue of not access to capital, you're exactly right. But in addition to that, I really think that we need to have more diverse leadership in this country, period, across every sphere, the political sphere, uh, the economic sphere, corporate, and everything. More diverse leadership in this country, period, across every sphere. Well, I wonder then if Dr. Jones de Weaver will be hiring a male co-president for her Exceptional Leadership Institute for Women. But that aside, how would one initiate such a change? How would you compel every sphere in this country to diversify their leadership? Mandated race and gender quotas? Civil or criminal penalties for noncompliance? Otherwise, you're just daydreaming rather than offering a solution. Because it's very interesting, we are going through a dynamic demographic shift in this country. Uh, as we sit here today, the majority of babies born in America are babies of color. Um, babies of color. Okay, and what, what does a demographic shift in skin color 
have to do with female empowerment. Uh, but interestingly enough, if you look at the dynamic of leadership in this country, uh, I would say that in many accounts, it's actually becoming whiter and whiter. Statistically speaking, that's the truth. Is that the truth? Well, I don't know. I guess I'll just have to take her word for it. But weren't we talking about women's empowerment? What has race got to do with it? If a leader is a woman, but she's white, then that's a bad thing? And so as we are changing our dynamic in terms of who we are as the citizens of this country, uh, we are also at the same time experiencing an, an increasingly white power, power sphere. A white power sphere. Okay, aside from conjuring an image of giving the Death Star a coat of eggshell colored paint, this notion is one that Dr. Avis really likes to promote as it's the same theory she put forth in her TEDx talk. The theory that, as the non-white population grows, white people are fearfully consolidating their power and control to defend themselves from the growing threat of minorities and are thus taking insidious strides to repress anyone who is non-white from achieving anything. Basically, Dr. Avis promotes the notion that white people are all a collective, racist hive mind. And that notion, in and of itself, is totally not racist. And so, you know, for us to be able to really be able to make the changes that need to be made in this country, generally speaking, as well as within specific communities, we need to make sure that we are, are able to be represented in official spaces of leadership. How about President of the United States? In public and in the private sphere. How about the Supreme Court of the United States? Uh, so that the needs of our communities can be heard and specifically acted upon. Where would you focus on and the I think. So I think my hesitation in, oh my God, I only get two important <laughs> things. Yes, two. The top two. And you were as silent as all the rest when you were asked to name them. But now you've had time to think about it, so... By all means, proceed. You Was, may have 10. Okay. Uh, what we've been talking about a little bit already in the panel is the need for an intersectional lens in thinking about injustice and that it's too, we've passed the point where we can say the biggest issue is gender, the biggest issue is race, the biggest issue is class because we have to start looking at all of them as so intertwined and so grounded in just the way that our communities survive that it, it becomes... Um, almost as a disservice to focus too much on just one of them at the same time. So I agree that income inequality, you can't move forward if you can't feed yourself and you don't have a job and you can't take care of your children. But also there's race and gender and ability and all, all of these other systems that are at work that are preventing us from moving forward. An intersectional lens. You cannot address any of these issues individually to find solutions, but you must instead conflate them all into being interrelated first, and then you can find a solution that addresses all of these disparate things. An intersectional lens will reveal some kind of all-purpose societal panacea. Is that what you mean? Because that is what it sounds like you are saying. And if that is what you are saying, then that is not an answer to anything. So, but I worry sometimes when we talk about intersectionality that it almost makes the problem too big, right? Right. It becomes, well, and they do this a lot in education, yeah. right? Right. Education, well, I really can't solve it till we talk about poverty. Well, we really can't solve that till we, you know, and at some point you're like, well, where are we, we going to, to start something. on this problem? So I'm going to push back on that and say, where, where, where would you, if you had to start to figure out how to move the needle even given all these, this intersectionality, which I think makes our problem just mm -hmm. bigger, where do we start? What is the thing that we do day one? Wow. I, I hereby award Soledad O'Brien the Great Minds Think Alike Award for common sense and critical thinking. That is precisely, though far more diplomatically, what I would have asked were I on that stage. Okay. 
Let's see what the response is. I, I, I could, or Dana, are you still going? Go no, you go. No, you go. No, but I'm you. still articulating. No, but I'm, I'm still... sorry. Go ahead. I want to, I'm doing, now I'm doing the Amy Schumer I'm sorry thing. Me, I'm sorry, Scott. Um, okay. I was just going to say, and this might make it even bigger than you want to go <laughs> instead of making it smaller, is to look at what we've been growing in this country, which is a culture of disconnection and of lack of really empathizing with each other and that that we're seeing across all of these different sectors. What? We need to look at the culture of disconnection, a lack of empathy across all of these different sectors. What sectors? Race, class, gender, etc.? I I just okay, maybe there's something coherent coming and this isn't just a verbose attempt to dodge the question. So how do we shift a conversation around the need for a connection and community building? Uh, as part of a solution that that, and in some ways that's a, a care, a female uh, um, caregiving as something that we are saying is part of a solution, but we need to see that across all different sectors, that why are we disconnected from each other so much? Nope. Pure babble. Either you have identified concrete steps to take in order to alleviate the things you see as problems, or you haven't. And if you haven't, then say you haven't. I don't know is a fair answer. However, by filling up airtime with buzzwords and platitudes, you really are telling us you have no ideas, but by obfuscating that admission, you're also telling us you're happy to be deceptive about it. What I was going to say, I mean, it is hard for me to pick the one thing, but I'm going to raise something that I think is very important to me and, and is a big one thing, which is the issue of girls and young women's confidence, and which often doesn't really get discussed. And I think in many ways, the lack of confidence um, and our not paying attention to that problem, maybe because we want to pay attention to more institutional issues, rightly so, um, maybe because it's too intangible for us to pay attention to, but when I think about like what's the one thing I want to give a girl, it is a sense of personal authority so that she can ask for what she needs and have agency in the world. What you want to give a girl is a sense of personal authority. If someone is given personal authority, can it really be personal? So girls do not have personal authority. They lack a sense of agency because they're girls, because society is holding them back. I would love to ask our speakers who gave them their sense of personal authority, who it was that provided them the agency to eventually arrive at a point where they are the featured speakers at a National Archives event. And for whatever reason, oh, well, thank you. Um, okay, cool. So what I was going to say about that, so here's something that kind of annoys me. I guess you might tweet this, whatever, it's fine. Yeah. But like, there's an intense focus right now on like girls in STEM, girls in STEM, girls in STEM. And I am all about girls in STEM. And yet, in many ways, we're not getting to the root cause of why girls are not succeeding in STEM, which is many of them lack a sense of confidence and personal authority once they find themselves as minorities in um, a science classroom. Girls are not succeeding in STEM because there are not enough girls in science classrooms. And there are not enough girls in science classrooms because they lack personal authority and agency. Authority and agency that they need to be given because they cannot generate it themselves, I guess. So, are you going to press gang more girls into science classes? What if they're not interested in science? What do you do then? And so I worry that we're continuing to repeat the pattern of let's make the girls just like the boys. Look, they can do a startup too without recognizing that there are different messages that girls internalize about how much space they can take up and um, with their opinions, with whatever it is. 
Uh, and we continue to not really address that root problem. Uh, and the longer we do that, I worry and kind of continue doing the STEM scene, we're really continuing to miss the point. Girls are inherently self-defeatist? I'm not sure what other message to come away with there. And I definitely agree with everything that Rachel said, and actually Rachel, someone else who I interviewed for my book, because that was one of the biggest obstacles to um, there being more women leaders is this internalized glass ceiling that girls feel that they don't um, value their voices and visions. Um, also that, um, that they, it's, if you, um, how uh, confident, uh, successful, powerful women are sort of thought of as unlikable and girls who want to please and be liked. This becomes sort of like this internalized things that keeps them very passive. Girls are inherently self-limiting and passive. Got it. Um, so I definitely totally agree that we have to focus on building self-esteem and leadership in girls. The operative term in self-esteem is self. No one is responsible for anyone else's self-esteem. And then I would say, you know, for me, obviously just related to just coming out of doing this book, the need to have more women in leadership positions, obviously in the political leadership, in the corporate sphere. Um, we were talking earlier about the need for more women in the media because the media shapes our consciousness. Right. The solution to everything is just add more women. Because they're women, I guess. But then connected to this other conversation, I think we need to transform how we think about how we use leadership and power. I hope that as women get into those positions that they don't feel like they have to mimic the ways it's traditionally been used and, you know, find different paradigms of power. So, you know, power to rather than power over. Um, so that's one of my biggest hopes is that that's one of the transformations that we'll see. And that's where the video clip abruptly ends. Okay, so let me see if I can sum this up. When asked what the top two priorities to affect change and women's empowerment in this country, we were told putting women into leadership positions, understanding that white people are power mongers, looking at the world through an intersectional lens, encouraging empathy in society to cure disconnectedness in all sectors, giving girls personal authority and agency, oh, and also putting women into leadership positions. This is now the second video of a panel discussion on women, by women, being asked a direct question on actions needing to be undertaken to solve the stated problems of gender inequality. And yet, once again, when asked bluntly to articulate the essential elements of achieving the change they want to see, the changes which are necessary to empower women, such questions are met with silence, non sequiturs, and blame gaming. And yet all of these speakers are women in leadership roles, founders of organizations, executives, and authors. They sit as living examples which counter the very issues and challenges that they tell us are so endemic to our society. So, are they unable to offer us anything solid because the problems are that complex? Or because they're proposing solutions to a problem that even they cannot precisely describe? The world may never know. As always, thank you for watching.